Hi, I'm Tyson Franklin, and welcome to this week's episode of the Podiatry Legends podcast. With me today is another legend. I'll start again. So if you're watching the video, see, things aren't always perfect. Let's do this again. Hi, I'm Tyson Franklin, and welcome to this week's episode of the Podiatry Legends podcast. Podcast is designed to help you feel, see, and think differently about the podiatry profession. Before I introduce my guest, I want to remind everybody, go and check out my YouTube channel. Just look for Tyson E. Franklin, podiatry advisor and mentor. I put a pile of videos there, which you should find entertaining and educational at times. So my guest today is a repeat offender. It is Dr. Patrick McEnany, and he has been, this is his fourth time he has been on this podcast. I recommend going back and listening to his other episodes when you finish this one. He was on episode 48, and it was titled, I've got them all written down here because there's that many of them, Rapid Business Expansion was the first one. Episode 74, eight business growth tips during COVID. That's right. There were growth tips during COVID. So if you didn't grow during COVID, you need to listen to that episode. And episode 108, you cannot manage 10 clinics yourself. So it's been more than 100 episodes since Patrick has been on this podcast. So we are going to get a a massive update on what he's been doing. So Patrick, how are you doing today? I'm doing great. Thanks for asking. Geez, that was a long intro, wasn't it? (laughs) (laughs) But <laughs> <laughs> then I gave you a quick response and kicked it right back to you. <laughs> so you you now have we we spoke off here just for a little bit. You now have fifteen clinics. So you've gone from ten when we spoke last time to fifteen. So I said to you, we're gonna we're now going to follow your career until one of us retires. So and if it's Love if I retire first, first yeah, if I retire first or whoever dies first. If it happens to be me because I'm older, then I'll have to get somebody to sit in my seat and follow your career until you retire. So 15 clinics. Yeah, we've been, uh, you know, it's been interesting because we've been uh, continuing to kind of follow our model of, uh, you know, organically growing and finding clinics, the, the people that are interested in selling clinics or joining our practice. And we've had a good combination of both of, of people who hand me the keys and leave and people who um, have stuck around and practice for a while. Um, and, uh, you know, we've, we've actually had even two more clinics, uh, 17, but, um, we bought two clinics that were across the street from each other Oh, right, okay. across the street. So we consolidated those ones. And we had another one that, um, was kind of a small satellite clinic that came with another purchase that, um, so we've been trying to kind of maximize our market share and and kind of decrease our overhead by having, you know, everything kind of in, in one area for some of these uh, clinics. Are you putting them all under the same name, one umbrella, yeah, or are you keeping the biz- the separate business names? No, right now uh, we've been. What we do is we do kind of a gradual transition. You know, we'll, we'll kind of send out a message. You know, we uh, you know say we're you know we're you know Northern Illinois Foot and Ankle Specialists is happy to partner with you know this practice, and then you know we, we usually give it a few months where people start to notice the name. Yeah, and then slowly the the other name fades away. Yeah, that's a good idea. It was when I remember when I, when I sold my clinic and the day I sold it, signed the contract, ink had dried, they pretty much had ripped down my, ripped down the signs and thrown their signs straight up. And it was probably one of the silliest things that they did instead of it just being this slow transition because it wasn't just changing it for the community, for the even for the staff who'd been there for a number of years, all of a sudden it was just this massive, massive change. And I think they've I think they changed their methodology uh, and future purchases. Well, and, and if you do that, if you, if you try to change everything overnight all at once, um, you know, patients feel like it's a different place. Yeah. And, you know, there was an orthopedic group in our area who um, they changed their name uh, uh, twice in uh, uh, under three years. And, you know, they had merged with another clinic and then they built their name up to a, another brand and, and, and people got confused. And they'd say, oh, you know, I don't go there. I was seeing this foot doctor at this ortho group, but, you know, they've, they've sold two or three different times and I, I want somewhere that's consistent. And it was yeah. the same people. And so, <laughs> so it, it, it's one of those things where, you know, you want to you wanna let people know that, you know, yes, you know, we're under new management, but things aren't going to change. And so, you know, if you, if you give them a new doctor right away and you give them a new clinic name and you give them new policies, they have one bad experience and they're never coming back because everything's changed. You know, they've been going there 10 years and everything's changed. But, you know, if you, if they see the same doctor, 
they see that the two names are together, you know, they get an email sent out, you know, saying, hey, you know, we're happy to partner with this doctor, you know, and then the doctor puts a little blurb that everything's going to be the same. We're happy to be part of this. We have more resources to offer you now. And, and you gradually kind of let the old name fade off and the new one stay. Patients do a lot better with that. So with your transition from 10 clinics to 15, has it been a lot more work? Or would you say that once you've got the systems in place and you have multiple clinics, going from 10 to 15 hasn't put that much more stress on you? Oh, no, it definitely puts more stress on you. Oh, it has? That's good. Okay, it's good. I'm glad, I'm glad you're stressed then. <laughs> um, but, you know, that's how you know your life. No. Um, so what winds up happening is, is things change. And so yeah. the, um, the system we have in place to acquire a clinic, I mean, we have a checkoff list now. So the minute someone, you know, the minute we pick up a new clinic, it's like, you know, we have like a, a month before, you know, uh, two months before, you know, a week before. And, and what we do is we, we gradually, you know, we, we start hitting that checklist. So we know what to do. We know what kind of pitfalls we're going to run into. Now, there's always surprises with every clinic. And there's, oh, of always, course. You know, there's always, you know, you find out that, you know, this guy, you know, you asked him for a list of his subscription services and he lists four and you get there and there's 30, you know, and, and so <laughs> there's, there's always things like that you have to look out for. Um, and so uh, it, it's just one of those things that, you know, each transaction you learn, all right, I didn't look out for that time. Didn't think that would happen. So, and then you put that on your checklist for next time. Yeah. Cause I was going to say that I, I don't think I know anybody that has bought that has purchased the practice where there has not been a surprise. And, and I don't think it's the, the person selling it is dishonest in any way, but they also want to paint their practices as, as valuable as possible when they're selling it to get the best price. And I don't think they right. deliberately leave things out, but I've been doing a list on Trello of all my subscriptions throughout the year. So as they've been coming through, I've been adding it to Trello. So next year I can look ahead of time and go, okay, am I still using this or should I get rid of it? And right. even I'm surprised, it's like every month something pops up and I go, I didn't realize I was on subscription. Well, and that's how they make their money. <laughs> yeah, and, and it's like that I don't use them. I go, oh, yeah, I do use that. But am I using it as much as I need to? If it, if it wasn't there, would my life change? So I think it's an important thing. Look, you said you're buying a practice and you get surprises. I think in life, you need to look at everything you're subscribed to. How many yeah, subscription TV channels do you really need? Right. <laughs> well, and, and so, you know, and, and I think you're right that, um, you know, the doctors don't, they're, they're not doing it maliciously when they leave this stuff out. Yeah. But what happens is that you, you get into a position where either they signed up for it a long time ago, you know, like, uh, you know, one of the things that I've seen people forget is they have a, a you know, they have their autoclave and there's a, you know, a company where you run a, you know, you run a little test strip you send it out to them once a month and they send you back the spore results to make sure it's working right. Yeah. Which, you know, great, great uh, habit to get into. Um, but what happens is that the medical assistants don't send it. They've been paying for the subscription and they haven't got sent, you know, a result in six years. And, and whether they haven't been sending the strip in or whether the company just stopped sending the results and they're still paying for it. And, and so, you know, one of the big things I do right now, I said, I need every subscription service you have. And, and some of the doctors don't even realize that the manager signed up for these subscription services. Yeah, I can understand and, that. And they, they don't even have the, path. you know, one of the practices I picked up, the manager, um, when we found out she was being bought, she quit, went somewhere else. And I asked the doctor, I said, where are your passwords? He goes, I don't even know. And so, you know, it, it creates a whole different type of, of, problem then because you have to figure out you know how to get these passwords and, and even you know your bills come in you go oh i guess you have a subscription for this so so it, it's just looking at little things like that you know you, you get you get burned once with it and you go, okay now i have to ask this question next time and, and my list of questions has gone from like this to you know a lot longer. The of, of stuff because you know it, it's it's one of those things so when you're looking for a practice to purchase, is there a certain profit margin you're looking for? And there a certain a dollar value that oh, it has a hundred thousand dollar profit, two hundred thousand dollars, or do you look at it that it's it's doing okay, breaking even, but you can see the potential in the growth of it? Is there 
Do you look, or do you look at both? There's several different things I look at. You know, number one is, is you want to look at what kind of income they're generating. Um, you know, obviously that's very important. Number two is I look at what their overhead and their expenses are. Yeah. Um, you know, some, some people have a, you know, they are bringing in a lot of money and then you find out that, you know, they're in an, an 11,000 square foot building. They use three treatment rooms and they got all this dead space they're paying for. And there's a huge overhead. Um, so I, I look at that. I look at the, um, I look at what the, what the competition is and, and you know, who's in the neighborhood. Um, I look at how big the town is, how big the surrounding towns are. Um, you know, because if you're the only guy in a, in a town of 5,000, that's one thing. But yeah. if you're in a town of 80,000 and you're one of four, you're better off in that town of 80,000, even though you got four other people. And, and so you have to look at that. You have to look at, um, you know, what type of neighborhood it is. And, you know, it, around the Chicagoland area, you find a, a lot of people that are in the really, uh, the really high end neighborhoods. And, but you'll find that there's, you know, seven people in this high end neighborhood that really probably only needs five, but you'll have a blue collar neighborhood four towns over that has nobody. And these guys have better insurance than the people in the nice neighborhoods <laughs> because they have unions and stuff. Yeah. And so you have to look at, you know, what type of insurance is in the, in the area. Um, you know, I love manufacturing areas because again, those people are, you know, really eager to get back up on their feet. So, so that's part of it. And then, you know, I look at what services that we have that they're not implementing. Okay. That's so a good point. It, 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 it's kind of like flipping a house. You know, if you flip a house, if you redo the master bathroom and you redo the kitchen, that's what's most valuable for flipping a house. Well, for me, when I get into a practice, if they're not, let's say I have a practice, and they're not doing any durable medical equipment, any DME, they're not doing boots and crutches and things like that. That's a nice chunk of my income. Um, you know, and, and in a lot of practices, that can be 25, 30% of your income. Okay. Um, on, on, top of, on top of that, you know, uh, I may have a practice that's not doing any surgery. And so, you know, if you have someone who's not doing any surgery, then there's potentially a lot of surgeries that are sitting there, people who just haven't been offered it because the doctor don't, doesn't do it. Um, additionally, you know, they may not be selling, uh, you know, cash products. They may not um, be working with, um, you know, non-covered services like laser therapy and shockwave therapy, stuff that isn't covered by the insurance, but also could be offered. And so it's interesting because some of these practices, you know, overnight, once you implement your system, you know, you can generate 50% more income overnight. They're good points. And that was why I wanted to get you back on here, because I think this episode is really going to be based around what you're looking for to buy a practice. And I know, yeah, even in Australia, probably every country, certain people will set a practice up from scratch. I've always set mine up from scratch. I think there's only one that I've, I've well, there's been a couple that have taken over uh, because they went broke <laughs> and I bought them off the off the receivers for a, for a steal, which is great. Not good for them. Good for me, though. But I think you know, there's also a lot of people who want to purchase another practice or they want to buy into an existing practice. So I think these are this is really good advice for people to not just look at the profit they're making now, but the potential that it could have. And I know there's podiatrists who have you know, one clinic, two clinics, and they're looking at purchasing other clinics. So what you're doing and what you're sharing with us is really valuable information. Thank you. Yeah, and, and it's one of these things that you really need to just, uh, if, especially if you're making your first purchase, you know, even if you started one, you know, you have to really talk to a lot of people, you have to read a lot and, and really learn the numbers. And so, you know, prior to all this starting, you know, there, there's, you know, something called EBITDA, which is uh, essentially like the raw number of what your practice is making after all the deductions, after, you know, everything that it's just the raw number that your practice is producing. Yeah. And, you know, uh, before I got into all this, I didn't even know what that, what that meant. It's a finance term. And, and so we now at our size, we have uh, about 110 employees, I think right now. And we have a full-time financial guy who now is able to crunch all these numbers for me. And I tell him what I'm looking for. And the way numbers people look at things are a lot different than how doctors look at numbers. Just like if, if they were looking at somebody who was bleeding, they'd think about it differently than we would. And so, you know, taking some time to like, if you're really going to get into this game of purchasing to really learn what the numbers mean and, and, and how they, how they work, 
because it, it, it's not the same. You know, when, when, when I talk to my financial guy, I'll be like, okay, we have money to do this. Let's just buy this. And they'll go, no, no, if, if we get a loan on this, I'm like, well, why pay interest on this? He's like, because we can deduct this, we can depreciate this, we can do this. And in the end, you're going to be up 2% risk if you just paid it off over, you know, over time or paid it off right away. And you have that money available for the next thing. And I go, oh, now that makes sense. But, but, but to me, you know, the old way of thinking was, well, why wouldn't I just pay it off? Why pay somebody interest? Yeah, and I have had that conversation with my own accountant when we've gone to purchase something. And yeah, and we've had you know, a number of accountants over the years, and they, they and they usually say to you, "Oh, yes, if you pay pay it outright, yes, you don't pay any interest. But what else could you do with that money? Is there something? Yeah. But if there's nothing else you got planned to do with that money, you say, okay, yeah, you, you will you will save interest. But I recall when I was setting a when I was setting a clinic up in Mackay, and I had money invested in uh, like managed funds, for example, and I remember taking it out of there. My financial advisor saying. What are you taking the money up? You know, managed funds are going so well at the moment. I said, yes, but if I take the money out of there and I invest it in this clinic, I know my return on this clinic is going to be far more than what managed funds will do. I, I have confidence in myself. And what was funny about it is I took the money out of managed funds. Managed funds bit the dust about two months later. So what I'd had in there would have only been worth about half. The money that I invested into the clinic, I got a 400% return in 12 months and so sometimes your financial guys can be right and sometimes you've got to go with your own gut feeling and experience well and you know i think that's very very true so you know i've had friends that have invested in other types of businesses they've invited in rest they've invested in restaurants and daycares yeah. and car washes and, and all this other stuff and and you know people you know are looking for silent investors and and I've been very careful not to invest in stuff like that because, you know, I can't, I don't know that industry as well as my own. And, and so why put my money in someone else's hands who they have to then produce something. And if they screw it up, I really can't help them True. because that's not my area of expertise. Whereas if I invest in podiatry and I invest in medicine, I know how all this works. And I know that I can get a reproducible result every time because I can put the work in. Versus handing the money to somebody else who I have to trust that they won't screw up my money. And I've heard of a lot of podiatrists doing that. And I remember talking to a person who specialized in bankruptcy. And he said, you would be surprised how many doctors, dentists, people in the medical profession who actually go broke because they've invested in things outside of their industry that they know nothing about. But because they were a successful doctor, their head swells up a little bit and they go, I am a legend, not a podiatry legend, of course. And therefore they, they think everything they touch is going to go great. And they do, they invest in things outside of the industry that they know nothing about and they have to trust that other people know what they're doing. And, you know, I've seen people get burned and it takes them a long time to, to pay off that debt. And, you know, again, I, I've always kind of kept the thing, invest in what I know. Yeah. You know, invest in stuff that I, I can physically put my hand on and control because, you know, if you invest in a restaurant and the restaurant goes south, you're not going to go there and start serving, you know, serving tables and, you know, prepping food in the morning. You know, you've got a different job you have to do. But if something goes wrong at one of my podiatry clinics, I can show up and I can fix it. You know, if, if someone if one of the doctors walks out tomorrow, I can show up and take that over. Whereas if it's running a restaurant, I can't show up and you know, be work the front of house and, and do the ordering because I know nothing about that. Yeah, and I, I wouldn't want you taking my order anyway. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> I'd rather you be operating on my feet. So with, you said you've got 110 employees. How many How many of those employees are podiatrists? Um, right now it's 19. Um, but uh, as we're speaking, we're a few days shy of that 15th office, the 15th office being a deal going through. Yeah. Uh, it'll, it'll, uh, we're looking at July 1st as a closing date. So I'll have another doctor. So we'll be up to 20. And then I have two more doctors that um, are coming out of residency that start with me uh, next month. Okay. And that's so how we'll Remy to- started with you that way, didn't he? Yeah, yeah, he did. He, he's finishing up his third year with me, Dr. Stackis. Yeah. Yeah. So he's been on the podcast as well. He was, uh, I can't remember the name of the, the episode, but it was about him being an Australian podiatrist 
who decided, no, I want to be a foot surgeon. So he went over to America, went through the whole DPM course there and then did his residency and then started working with you. Yeah, it was great. We, you know, we worked with him as a resident, which was, uh, you know, working with residents and, and we also a fellowship program. It's, it's a nice way to kind of learn about these doctors, see how their hands are, see how they interact with people and kind of almost test them out before you hire them. So it's a, it's yeah. a great little way to do that. Because that's been a thing. I did an episode a uh, few episodes back. Why I left podiatry, and it was a it was a two part episode, and it seemed to be a problem across all countries, not just Australia, UK, but also in America, of people getting into podiatry and leaving again. And a lot of podiatrists have complained they find it really really hard to find staff. Now with fifteen clinics, and you're going to have yeah twenty twenty two uh, podiatrists working there. Have you? Do you have a process of how you find good podiatrists or do you obviously they come out of residency, you have a great mentoring process as well to keep them? Yeah, the, the few questions there. So, the, you know, the first question is, you know, I'm constantly talking to people. Yeah. So, you know, I, I you know, run into podiatry students at meetings. I talk to them for a while. You know, I talk to residents. I talk to even people who are prospective podiatry students. Some of them come and visit the clinic and, uh, you know, I just kind of get to know everybody, you know, they get to know me and, you know, I, I always make myself available for questions and to talk to them. And, you know, what happens is as they get closer to being done, sometimes they'll contact me or, you know, they'll say, Hey, you know, I'm moving to Detroit, but one of my friends is interested, you know? And, and so I, I do what I call, I create like a little bullpen and I yep. talk to different doctors who I haven't talked to, you know, in a while, or, you know, uh, I'll just say, Hey, you know, you're thinking about jumping ship and they're like, well, you know, I'd have to be in the right area. I'd want to be near this clinic. Yeah. And one of my docs, I, I bugged for 10 years. And uh, she was a, a fellow resident of mine, Dr. Ashley Lee. And I bugged her for 10 years. And she said, I would have to be in this area. So I call her up. I'm like, all right, I got a clinic in that area. When are you coming over? And and it took 10 years, but, you know, I, I wore her down like any good woman. And I uh, finally got her to... <laughs> you used like, your charm. Right. <laughs> so... so I, I am constantly kind of wheeling and dealing and kind of getting to know people, letting them get to know me. It's like, it's like courting. It's like a relationship. And it's so, true. you know, you have to meet with them several times. You know, I, I'll go to a dinner and see some other doctors. I'll sit with people I don't know, you know, uh, get to know them a little better. And, and hopefully, you know, if the time's right, you know, they're there, they're ready when I'm ready, or they'll know somebody who who's looking also, you know, and if I don't have a doctor readily available, I'll just start shooting texts out. So I'm like, oh yeah, so-and-so isn't happy. So-and-so just quit. They're looking for something. And it's amazing sometimes how quickly you can find people that way. Yeah, it's it, I've heard it referred to as digging the well before you need the water. Absolutely. And, and that's because- not just with staff. It's just relationships in general is connecting with people and being in their life and helping them where you can. Because one day when you need help, if all of a sudden you've been a complete stranger to everybody and all of a sudden you, you start screaming, I need help. People go, who are you? And it's the same right. with attracting staff. If you're, if the students know who you are while they're a student and you have something to do with the university and when they graduate, you're, you're being seen, you're being heard, you're being helpful. You're there reaching out. Hey, if you need a hand with anything, when you are looking for staff, they're going to know who you are. Right. Well, and, and we do the same thing even with our, our regular staff. So, you know, I know a lot of people when they're looking, when they finally need a doctor, they, they start looking. And yeah. even with our staff, we keep most of our ads open all year round. And if I, if I don't need a receptionist, we still have an ad up. And we still interview. Because, you know, sometimes you be like, hey, listen, I really like you. We don't have a spot for you. But if something comes up, I'll let you know. And then two months later, somebody quits or you need another person. And, and you can actually call those people. And, and they might already be at another job, but you can make them an offer that they can't refuse. And the, the other way we do this too is sometimes you'll interview somebody like for a position, you'll go, this person's so good. Yeah. I, I, I'm not going to put them in that position, but I'm going to find something for them to do because I think they're going to excel no matter where I put them. And, and so I do that with staff, but I also do that with, with the doctors too. We, we'd done that. There was a physiotherapist that had a receptionist. She was fantastic. And every time I went there, I used to say to her, when you're ready to leave, let me know. I said, because I would love to have you working in my clinic. Now, this went on for three years. 
And then one day I walked in there and I always said the same thing. Hey, just remember when you're ready to leave, I'll have a position for you. She went, as a matter of fact, I'm ready. And a week later, she started with us. And we've done the same thing at restaurants. You know, when you get served by somebody and you'd swear they own the business. And I always ask them, I go, do you own this business? And they go, no. I go, well, you work like you do. If you're ever thinking of changing industries, here's my card, reach out to me. Same thing, dig, you know, dig the well. And you know, I've actually had, you know, a few servers that I've brought into the office, yeah. um, you know, because if you think of servers, you know, they, number one, they have to collect money uh, because some people aren't, aren't comfortable collecting money or asking for money. So they have to collect money. They have to charm you, um, you know, so they get a good tip and, you know, they have to be friendly and smile. And, and you know, if you're, if you're looking at a reception person, you need that. Additionally, yep. they multitask. They have to they have to worry about you know six or seven tables at once. And you know if you look at you know the receptionist, they're checking people in, they're checking people out, they're taking payments, they may be checking insurance benefits, they're you know answering the phone, and and, and all that's going on at once. And, and so I've found that you know for a lot of my reception, like if you can find a really good server, they make a great front desk person. Yeah, and their attention to detail is also good. They yeah, they, they need to. to know if there's eight people at a table. They need to know who ordered what, get the order correct. Right. And make sure everything is a smooth experience. Because especially like in America, they they revolve around that. They rely a lot on tips. Yeah. Australia, they don't get tipped. So, yeah, you get a lot more. that are, You get a few more nasty ones over here. But because <laughs> <laughs> they're getting paid 30, 30 something dollars an hour regardless. Whereas in America, I have noticed when I've been in America, the service is so much better. In, in a lot of different it areas. It has to be. It has to be. I mean, I mean, some of them, you know, in American, they, you know, they get paid, a, you know, a few bucks an hour, and you know, the rest of it's all based on tips. And so, um, they live and die by that. So they they have to be nice. And and that's why, again, that attention to detail. You know, they'll carry five dinners out on a tray and realize the one burger's got ketchup that wasn't supposed to. And you'll see them turn around, go back, you know, have them refire that one while they're bringing the rest of the stuff out. And, and you need someone like that who, who has that attention at the front desk. So do you think employing somebody like that, you have noticed that they have been uh, better at the front desk than people have not had that sort of service? Or this is all part of your training anyway, that you're going to teach them this is what we do? Well, again, I, I think you can teach anybody to do, any, to do anything like in an office like that, yeah. but they have to have the right attitude. And so, you know, you can't teach attitude you can't teach hard work. You can't teach drive. And, and so if, if you give me that, I can make a medical assistant. I can make a front desk person. You know, I, I can train you to be everything if you're open to learning and, you, and you'll work hard. That's not the hard part. It, the hard part is finding people with those, those inherent qualities, you know, that are ingrained in you. Yeah. I, th I think a lot of it, I think you can teach people to be better than what they are if you show them how, but I think a lot of it's, it's either ingrained in you to do that or not. My parents, especially my mum, that I really respect her for this, used to tell me anytime I had a part-time job, be the first one there, be the last one to leave and work harder and faster than everybody around you. Because if they're ever looking at getting rid of someone, it will never be you because you'll, right. you'll be worth too much to that business. And whenever you have a holiday break and you say, hey, I'm available, they will snap you up in a heartbeat. And... I carry that right through high school, university with all my part-time jobs. And then it was such a habit. That's what I carried into setting up my own practices. And then you don't know any better. You, you know, I you, don't you, know you, any you, better. Yeah. Go. And that's just how you've been trained. Cause you know, I, you know, that's how I was taught by my parents. You know, I wrestled in high school and college and you know, that kind of drive was there too. You never stop. You work hard. You go, 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 go. And that ran through, you know, med school, ran through residency and, you know, I got into practice and I've been running, 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 running. And then it's like, you know, people are like, well, why don't you slow down? It's like, I don't know how to. And, and if I did, I'd get bored. Yeah. It's fun. That's why when I, I see some employees and they'll, they'll complain that they have to yeah, work 40 hours a week in Australia, it's 38 is your standard uh, work week. But if they have to do 40 hours or 44 hours and they had to do that a number of weeks in a row, even though they're being paid because someone might be away, you can see them, some of them just getting tired. Whereas if I only worked 40 hours a week, I'd be bored. 
because I right. just I enjoy what I do. And I'm the same way, you know, I, I you know, I, I get home from work and, you know, play with the daughter, have something to eat. You know, as soon as she goes to bed, the laptop's back open and, you know, I'm plotting <laughs> and scheming for the next day and the next acquisition. I love that plotting and scheming. So how, how's the what's your what's your wife think of everything that you're doing? Uh, she thinks I'm nuts. Um, but but, but it's changed. It's, it's changed because, you know, when I first started doing this, you know, she was looking at it as I was taking these big risks, you know, yeah. and, you know, she'd say, you know, you pick up another office, I'm out of here, you know, and, and you know. It, it <laughs> what was, number, but not, what number did she say that a bit? Number three, the three uh, or four? She said that number, yeah, number three, four, five, six, probably up until about 10. And yeah. then after that, uh, I think she realized that I know what I'm doing. Uh, you know, I don't think she thinks I didn't know what I was doing, but she's, she's conservative. She's not a risk taker and I am. Yeah. And so, you know, but with me, these are all calculated risks. You know, again, these are things that I know. These are things that, you know, I have systems in place. And so, um, you know, as things got, you know, bigger and grew more, you know, she became very accepting of that. But, you know, she's also very cautious and is like, don't take on too much. You know, don't do too much. I don't want to see an early grave. So, and she does have I, a point. I, I told her life insurance policy signed. So uh, I don't know what you're worried <laughs> about, but. Um, but so, you know, again, and, and a lot of this, you know, is taking on what you can handle. And, yeah. and you know, I, I, you know, there's physical therapy groups by us that are like expanding huge and their goal is to put in 30 new clinics next year. And, and mine, I don't have a goal. It's, it's, you know, good acquisitions that I think are going to be successful and, uh, you know, make sure it's, we have the, the, what we can handle. And, you know, we purchased a bunch of offices shortly after we talked last time you know, after all these acquisitions, I had to backfill my infrastructure. I had to hire more people, get some more managers, get like a, you know, kind of a middle management level. Yeah. And then once that happened, then I was ready to take on some more acquisitions. You know, we did that. And then, you know, we slowed down a little bit, you know, and, uh, you know, last year we made, we purchased uh, three offices in January and then two offices uh, on New Year's Eve. And, uh, you know, in between that, you know, we looked at offices, but we didn't purchase any. We spent the whole year building our infrastructure back up um, because if you make a bunch of purchases, all of a sudden you realize you don't have enough people to, to do all the jobs. I think the other important thing that you've done as well that I didn't do, because I had like five clinics at one stage and my clinics were spread 1,800 kilometers apart, which is about 1,200 miles, which there were a lot of plane flights and driving involved, whereas you've kept all your clinics in a manageable area so what's what's the radius the distance between most of your clinics yeah the, the farthest distance from like my the farthest apart clinics is probably a little over two hours two two and a half hours yeah so everything is driving distance everything's driving distance and it's it's all drivable you know you know in half a day you know so because of that you know i can touch any one of my clinics any day that i need to or that my staff needs to yeah and and even even more so what we've done is we've divided the map into four regions the north south east and west and each region has three to four offices and now i have a, a clinic manager that's in charge of each region and then there's a, a director of uh, clinical operations who uh, manages those four people and then okay. below that we're working on and we're not 100 there yet but each clinic is going to have like a lead medical assistant that runs their own clinic and then they report to their their clinic manager who then reports to, to the director. And, and so by building, and that was the infrastructure we worked on building up so that I didn't have to get every single phone call every time something went wrong. That's you true. Know, I was able to, to do that. Um, one of the other things that really made a big difference is, uh, you know, we hired our own IT people. I have two full-time IT people. And then I have full, two full-time maintenance people. Oh, and good. Maintenance people, like, you know, because, you know, you have, you know, you have a light go out and you need electrical work. And, you know, next thing you know, you're paying a fortune, you know, and, and out, out in America, you know, some of the trades have kind of been overlooked for a while. And I mean, they'll charge you 150, 200 bucks to come out and just look at a toilet, <laughs> which, you know, it, it's crazy. You know? <laughs> I always remember, did you ever used to watch Gilligan's Island? Uh, a little bit. Yeah. Yeah. And I always remember and Thurston Howell the third, who was like, uh, yeah, a multi, multi, multi millionaire on the island in those days. And I remember one particular episode when something needed to get done, they needed a TV repairman. 
And Thurston Howe went, my God, even I can't afford one of them. So it's always been this certain trades, even though I don't think we have TV repairmen anymore. We throw them at the dump and we buy a new TV. Right. But yeah, trade people can be expensive. And we, we created a, a disaster folder where we had a big list of who our go-to plumber was, our go-to electrician, every single thing that you could possibly need. We had developed this folder. So if something went wrong, they knew who to call. They didn't ring me first and say, yeah, toilet's backed up. I can't help. Get a plumber. Well, and and we, we had something like that too, but what wound up happening even better now is because I've got these two full-time maintenance guys, and I mean, they do everything from plunge a toilet, changing filters, they yeah. lay new floors, they do touch-up painting, they um, put in new counters, they renovate offices. And they do about 95% of what needs to be done. But like, if I have like my air conditioner go off in an office, I'm not calling the air conditioner company right away. I call them, they go, and sometimes they're able to fix it. Or if they're not, then they call the guy. When the guy comes out and the guy says, oh, it's going to be, you know, $6,000 for this. The guy, you know, they go, bullshit. You know, it's not going to be $6,000. <laughs> you know, I looked at it. It's just the this and this. That's a $2,000 fix. Yeah. And, and so so they've been able to save me money from that standpoint. But um, the amount of money that having someone like that on staff has saved me, it, uh, you can't even count it, um, you know, with, you know, the little fixes, let alone the big renovations. Yeah, that, I, I just think it's great that you've put the right people in place. So out of curiosity, with all the people that are working for you, do you know everyone's name? Sure. <laughs> no. <laughs> um, so, um, I, I wouldn't expect that you would. Like if you've no, got one of your anymore. clinics, which is two, two hours away, and you've got managers in place, and they've probably employed people in certain roles in the business that you don't even need to know about. They just fill the spot. I'll tell you that everybody who's been with me more than a year, I know their names. Oh, good. Okay. And, and so, you know, but, you know, we have times that, you know, we have someone in another clinic who, you know, uh, and usually uh, once or twice a year, I'll take a week off and I go visit all the clinics and I meet the staff. I, I check for quality. You know, I, you know, you, you walk in, you open up a closet and there's like, you know, there's 200 pairs of crutches in there. And you're like, why do we have this many? We're short in the other office, you know, yeah. stuff like that. So, so I usually do that and kind of, you know, meet up with people then, but it, it, you know, you, you try to know everybody, but you know, with people coming in and people coming out, you know, and, and with everybody having masks on still too, you know, in, in, in our state, you still have to wear masks in a medical clinic, yeah. you know, I know what they look like from here. You know, just the <laughs> Yeah, it's true. Well, I think it's, it's the same in Queensland at the moment. In medical places, you still have to wear wear a mask, but it is getting a little more a little bit more lax. And not even though you're supposed to, not every place does. Some of them just go, "Yeah, don't worry about it." Yeah, yeah, it's uh, the, the state's still pushing that right now, but but we are able to get on airplanes, so uh, yeah, I don't know. So, do you have better like bulk buying power when it comes to ordering equipment, buying stock? Do you do you buy it in bulk and then distribute it, or does each place? order their own, yeah, no, but you've got to deal with some of the suppliers. Yeah, so, you know, there, there's a couple of different things I do. You know, one thing is that, you know, we have a lot of group purchasing organizations Yeah. where, you know, you have companies that will get together, you join, you know, you join their, 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 their GPO and they will get good purchasing prices for you. And so, you know, that's kind of what I did when I started off early. And so, you know, a, a lot of times we'll get these GPO prices. Now, at times I'm able to call up those people and say, listen, I'm going to be ordering more than this. I want a better discount. Yeah. And companies that aren't part of GPOs, you know, you can do that with. And some of the ones in the GPOs, you know, you'll they'll go, oh, I can't give you, you know, any cheaper, but I can throw in five extras. And and so, you know, the, the bigger you get and the more you're using, the, the less they want to lose your account. And so, you know, but you, you have to ask for those things. If you don't ask for them, you're never going to get them. They're not going to offer them. Yeah, well, we did the same. Even when we had the five clinics, I remember approaching some of the suppliers and saying, I will make sure that each clinic orders from you this particular item if you'll do it at this price. And they go, yeah, not a problem. And that was only with five clinics. So I could picture you having 15, you would have a little bit more uh, strength and you know, a little bit more buying power than, than what I had. Well, absolutely. And, and, you know, a lot of companies say, oh, you know, well, you know, this brace, it's 300 bucks. You know, I... You know, I'd like you. You know, we can get it down to 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 two fifty or two seventy five. You know, for you. And I go, uh, I go. What if I bought fifty? And they'll go, Oh, well, we can <laughs> probably do it for two sixty. I said, Good. I said, What can you do for a hundred? 
And they'll be like, oh, well, I said, well, you do them for 250 and I'll order 100 today. I said, here's my credit card. And, and so by being able to do that, you know, I can take that, get a huge discount, knowing that our burn rate on that product is four months. And if I could yeah. burn through all of those in four months, it's worth paying all that money up front because you put on your credit card, you get another month to pay it. Now you're down to three months to burn through all that. And plus, you said there were 300 at the beginning. You've just bought 100 of them with a $50 discount. There's five grand that you've just saved. Yes. Absolutely. Which so, so adds there's, to there's the bottom line. You, yeah, and, and so there's a lot of ways you can kind of play those games, you know, with some of these companies. No, this has been great. So I'm glad I got you back on because, like I said, I wanted this episode to, because I know there's a lot of people purchasing practices who are thinking about it. So I think there's a lot of tips that you've given that will point people in the right direction, questions to ask, things to look for, but also people who want to have multiple clinics. Some of the things you've said, there, there's there's more benefits in have in there's a lot of benefits in having multiple clinics, but there's also having two clinics, you don't get double the profit, but you do get extra hours. So this is one of my final <laughs> questions for you. How many hours a week do you work at the moment? Um realistically, not once because you're doing it because of the fun of doing it. Just well, you know, I'm in I'm in clinic um, about three days a week. I got two days a week for uh, operating room and administrative time. So you know, I'm usually good for you know about seven thirty till uh, you know till about four or five. Yeah. And then uh, you know, I uh, sometimes I have meetings in the evening. You know, usually I have at least one meeting a week in the evening. And then, uh, like I said, most nights it's a few hours with the kiddo, and then uh, you know back you know to work for another two or three hours before bed okay but you enjoy it uh, i do enjoy it. i do enjoy it you know one of my one of my staff members uh in, in my office i have a big map of the chicagoland area and i have all my little offices pinned so you know i'm bad with direction so this helps me kind of visualize <laughs> and uh and i'm just sitting there kind of you know staring at the map and and she's like do you play the game risk you familiar with the game risk yeah the board game she's like do you yeah. play risk at home i go no i'm playing it every day <laughs> <laughs> and so uh you know it, it, it's kind of one of those things that, that you know i i still enjoy the um you know the the kind of rush of the acquisition the you know six months later when everything's acquired you know the doc stayed on he's like this is great i love being here thanks for doing this and the clinic's productive and and, and you you really help build your team it, it's so much fun I've got just a couple other questions before we wrap up and more around the ideas of marketing is when you take over somebody's practice, they've probably got a website already established. What do you do with that website or do you sort of just then amalgamate it? Yeah. Do, do, do all your appointments all come through one website or what do you do with the other websites once you purchase a clinic? Yeah. So, you know, there's a, there's, I've done it a couple of different ways. You know, one is that, you know, I've just redirected the, the website name to a new to our new website, yep. um, which uh, sometimes confuses the patients because they're, you know, they're used to clicking and seeing a different color website, a different picture. So, um, you know, what we'll usually do is, is in the beginning, we'll have the website and it'll kind of pop up the old website and it'll say, you know, it'll say, you know, you're now happy to, to you know, partner with Northern Illinois Foot and Ankle Specialists. And then you can actually get it set up where it redirects 10 seconds later to your real website. Okay, this and is what so your IT kind of guys like, help you do all this anyway. Right, and so it's kind of more of a, a transition then. Yep, that's good. Which uh, I think patients then, they, again, they have to see that someone didn't take over their doctor and kick them out. That this is <laughs> something that your doctor wanted and he wants you to be part of this. Yeah. Okay, last question before we wrap up. What's your number one marketing tip? You've got 15 clinics. What, what's your go-to marketing tip? to for for all your practices talk to people yep. and, and when i say talk to people i mean you know talk to other doctors talk to you know I, I go to my daughter's gymnastics you know practice and you can sit there on your phone just you know staring at your phone your whole time or you can talk to the soccer mom sitting next to you and, and so i try to talk to people wherever i go and, and like in real life like i'm happy just sitting quiet you know staring at the wall you know getting a you know a little you know brain rest for a while but but going out and talking to people and meeting people, it's so easy to develop relationships. And, and these aren't people that you're, you may necessarily, you know, uh, you know, go out to dinner with, but these are people where you meet them, they, they go, oh, he seemed like a nice guy, you know, and, and they find out your doctor and they go, oh, give me your card in case they ever need it. 
And eight months later, that person shows up in your, in your clinic. And, and so I, I think the biggest thing is just get out, meet people, talk to people. That's great advice. I think that, that is fantastic advice because I know a lot of people, and I assume you, you probably still do Google ads and, and other online marketing, which a lot of people do. But I always say when you're doing that, you're really just, you're paying for an audience. Whereas what you're doing, I think long-term when you're creating your own content and you're getting out there and meeting people. And I think networking is a, is one of the best things I ever did for my own practices. Of course. And the, the reason that it's not done as much is because it takes work. Yeah. You know, throwing money at Google is easy and that's why everybody does it. And, you know, you have to throw more money than the next guy. And, and you know, if you look at customer acquisition cost, you know, that's a lot higher than, you know, if I'm sitting somewhere and I'm at a soccer game and I'm waiting 45 minutes for the game to get over and, you know, talking to people is free and you're already there. And so, you know, I, I tell people, use every opportunity to, to get to know people because that person you meet today, they may not come back for three years, but when they come back, that made that, that 10 minutes of conversation worth it. Yeah. I remember when I set my clinic up in Cairns and when I did Mackay and any business I've set up, is I would wear my work shirt, like a polo shirt that had my business name on there, seven days a week. Yep. All the time at work and even on weekends, I had other ones that I'd wear over the weekend. People go, don't you ever take your work shirt off? No, not initially because I want people to know what I'm doing. When I'm talking to the person at the hardware store, when I'm buying the newspaper, buying a carton of milk, I'll, you know, the person at the shopping center, I want them to say, oh, are you a podiatrist? Yes, I am. And it just sparks a conversation. Well, and, and what I did for my business, and this is a good tip is, you know, I bought, um, I bought all my doctors uh, jackets. They're like, you know, spring fall jackets Yeah. Um, with our logo on them. And then uh, we set up a spirit store and uh, right after Christmas this year, you know, every staff member got to pick something from the spirit store. And part of the reason I do that is so that they're walking, they're my walking advertisement. Yeah. And, you know, I, I've been out at the grocery store and I had three people stop me in a trip to the grocery store. And they say, oh, I've, do you know Dr. So-and-so? I've been thinking about going to see them, you know, or, or hey, oh, you do foot and ankle? Oh, I've been having this problem. You know, who do I go see? And so people recognize the logos. They're looking at them all the time. And so, you know, why, why wear something, you know, a shirt that says eat at Joe's when you could be, you know, a place that says come to my place? Yeah, I, yeah. And, and it's a, to me, it's an opportunity. I think especially when, you're first setting up your practice and you're trying to get some traction in town is Nike will not pay you money to be wearing a Nike shirt at work. So you may as well have your own shirt and be wearing it as much as you can. And then eventually, yes, you can put on other clothes and, and wear it around. But yeah, I love the idea, especially swag for your own, but for your own business. Well, and, and, you know, all it takes is one person to come back to the, to the practice because you bought, you know, a, a jacket or shirt for one of your staff members, and that pays off the the entire investment. And you, you've got a pro, uh, yeah, not pro arch, was best say pro arch, but I that was my old clinic, podiatry legends podcast shirt, don't you? Yeah, I do. I do. Yeah, I'll bring you a hat. I'm coming over in October, as I mentioned, so we will catch up in October when I come to Chicago, and I, I even have the uh, podiatry legends caps now, so I'll bring you one of those over. Awesome. I appreciate that. <laughs> so Patrick, if anyone wants to reach out to you, what's the, what's the best way of doing it? Um, you know, my email is probably best, um, which is uh, dr, like doctor, and then my last name, McEnany, M-C-E-N-E-A-N-E-Y, at IllinoisFoot.com. Cool. Okay, so Patrick, I want to thank you for coming on the Podiatry Legends podcast again, episode four. Thanks for having or me. fourth episode. Yeah. And like I said, I, I want to get you back at least once a year, just to see your transition and see what you're doing. Because every time we speak, you're you're sharing something new, and and like I always say, if people just pick up one, two, three, three points from any conversation I have with somebody, then it's worth having you back on here all the time. So thank you very much. Thank you. Appreciate it.